Now, I want you to think about fear just for a little bit, um, and we're going to group in here uh, worry, anxiety. They're all uh, fairly similar. Now, I would say this, that uh, some of us are going to deal with fear and worry and anxiety some of the time. And I would say that virtually every one of us is going to uh, deal with either worry, fear, or anxiety uh, at least some of the time. Now, uh, God says dozens of times uh, in the scripture, he addresses these three things. Uh, God says things like, uh, we looked at this one last week, do not be afraid because uh, I am with you. God says uh, in Joshua, uh, he says, do not uh, fear, do not be afraid because uh, you can be strong and courageous. God says, uh, Jesus actually says this one, um, don't worry. Um, And then he gives us this really cool question. He says, is worry really going to add a single day to your life? Uh, Jesus talks about worry when he says, I want you to not worry, but, but seek God first above all else and God will supply everything that you need. Um, Paul talks about uh, don't be anxious. But then he says this one. He says, but, but pray about everything. Now, just from my own personal experience, I can tell you that every single time that I've prayed, every time I, I've brought some anxiety to God, every single time, there's never been an exception. You know, I have always found myself in a better place. You know, uh, Peter, he talks about uh, don't be anxious. Um, give God all your anxiety because... God cares about you. Now, I want you to think about, uh, like, some of the fears that we face in life. Now, I'm not thinking, like, you know, like, um, heights or clowns or whatever it is that you might be afraid of. Um, I want you to think about some of the real fears that we have to deal with, like loneliness. I think that loneliness is a pretty big fear for some of us. Uh, We just don't want to be alone. You know, we could even be surrounded. We could be sitting right next to somebody. And we can be alone, and that, and that scares us. Uh, some of us, um, you know, we fear rejection. Just a quick poll. Um, who in this room likes to be rejected? Raise your hand. All right, so we only got one back there. <laughs> He's uh, three years old, and he'll understand someday that uh, he should not have raised his hand. Um, think about failure. We don't like to fail. We, we, uh, we fear failure. We, we fear the future. Um, now, I want to talk about a, a little bit about uh, fear and anxiety and worry. Um, many of us are going to spend more time and more energy avoiding the things that we worry than we do spend time and energy um, you know, like ach- achieving goals and uh, pursuing dreams in our life. I mean, these things are, these things are time killers. These things are, are energy killers. Uh, fear is going to do a couple things to us. It, it's going to freeze us. Uh, it can immobilize us. It can keep us exactly where we are. Or fear can also have a very positive construct. Fear can actually move us forward. Fear can motivate us and uh, give us energy. Now, last week I talked about this one. Uh, giving into fears is going to be one of the easiest ways for us um, to diminish our dreams and humiliate our hopes. Um, we have a choice in life, and, and I want you to think about this. Uh, we can do one of two things. Uh, you know, we can either uh, feed our fears. Um, we can feed our fears or we can face our fears. We can, we can feed our fears or we can feed our faith. Now, there's a Native American story uh, about a grandfather who was talking to a grandson. And, and he told his grandson, he said, uh, in life, there's going to be a battle inside of me, and there's going to be a battle inside of you, and there's a battle inside of all of us. And this is a battle between uh, two wolves. Now, there's a, a good wolf and a bad wolf, and they're going to battle inside of you, and one of these wolves is going to win. Now, one of them is an evil wolf, and he represents anger and envy and sorrow and regret and, and greed and fear and anxiety and worry. Now, the other is a good wolf who represents peace and joy and love and faith and hope, and and courage. So think about that. This is the battle that we have um, inside of us. And the grandson is curious who wins, so he asks the grandpa, well, which wolf then wins the war? And the grandpa looked at the kid, and he said, the wolf that wins the war is the one that you choose to feed. So think about that. You either feed your fears, or you feed your faith. You either feed your fears, or you face your fears. Now, uh, as humans, we have a couple um, 
we have a couple uh, uh, needs that we have. We have a need that we are known. You know, we have a need that we're known, and we have a need that uh, we know something else. So, like, in this context, think, like, as people, we have a need to be known by somebody else, and we have a need to know somebody else. We have a need to know God, and we have a need to be known by God. We're simply wired that way. Our life is not complete unless we're known and unless we know. Our life is not going to be complete unless we love and we're loved. So we have this need as human beings to love other people. We're just wired that way. Think about what your life would look like if you didn't love another person. Now, I want you to think about this as well. Uh, what would your life look like if you were not loved by another person? We are created to love and to be loved, both by other people and by God. So what happens when we're not loved? What happens when we're not known? Is we ask us, ourselves a question, and this is, some, this is one of the fears we're going to look at. Now, if I would ask you what your fears are, I don't think that many of you would say this, but I think if we did a little bit of soul searching, if we did a little bit of digging, most of us would find that one of our fears in life is, do we really matter? You know, am I contributing um, uh, to the good of the world? At the end of the day, um, after all the coming and going, will, will anybody know who I am? We have a fear of not mattering. We have a, a fear of not making a contribution to the world. Now, I just want you to think about this, like this fear of not mattering. Now, think about a time like when a friend told you that uh, he or she was going to call you, and they didn't call you. That didn't feel very good, did it? In fact, it may uh, have made you feel like you just didn't matter. Or have you ever like sent a text message to someone before and like even like with a new iPhone, so you can tell if they've read it or not. It says like read at 307 and it's like 715 and they haven't responded to you yet and you just feel like you don't matter. Um, what about this one, like at work or in school when someone else gets credit for something that you do? Uh, that doesn't really feel good because all of a sudden it seems like we don't matter. One of the things that really gets to me with our culture today is so many places and so many times uh, that we're a number and we're not a name. Yeah, the number basically says that, that we, I was talking to an insurance adjuster earlier this week and they wanted my social security number. It's like 485, so I'm not gonna tell you the rest of it. Uh, they videotaped these things and put them on the internet, but it was like, it was, I was a number. I, I didn't feel like I, I was known. I definitely didn't feel like I was loved, especially after the conversation. Um, <laughs> that's a different sermon illustration for a different day. But I think you've felt that way as well before. Like, some of us may have thought, like, you know, I just, I don't have the right job. Like, I'm not a micro-nuclear physicist or something like that. Therefore, I don't matter. You know, some of us, I mean, for the kids, I mean, maybe you, your last report card wasn't the best report card you've ever had. And, like, you wonder to yourself, do, do I really matter? Maybe you're not the best player on your sports team and maybe you're not even good enough to be on a sports team and you ask yourself the question, do I matter? And we don't hang out with the right people, we don't wear the right clothes. Maybe some of us, we look in the mirror. Some of us, we, we get in front of that mirror and we say, this is not what I want to look like. This is not the person that I don't want, this is not the person that I want to be, so, so, so I don't matter. Now what's really cool is that Jesus gathered a bunch of people who I don't think they really, I think they think that they didn't really matter at all. In fact, he, he gathered 12 of them. He gathered, uh, and let's look at verse 1. Um, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Now, there's three words I want you to look at there in verse 1. Uh, Jesus gave them authority. So now all of a sudden, even if they thought they didn't matter, even if you could make a case that they didn't matter, now all of a sudden they matter and they matter a whole bunch because Jesus gave them authority. This is nothing that we've earned. It's nothing that we deserve. Jesus went and he picked these 12 guys out and he gave them authority. All of a sudden, these men matter. Now the same call that these 12 disciples have is the same call that each of us have. They live in a dark and a lonely and a hurting world. And guess what? Guess what? We live in a dark and a hurting and a lonely world. The same call that these 12 have is the same call that each of us have. And what God does is he gives us authority. And all of a sudden, not because of what we've done, not in spite of what we've done, but because of who God is, all of a sudden, we matter. Now let's look at these, uh, let's look at these names. Um, 
this is not a history lesson here. This is not like a little side. I mean, we're going to see that these men don't matter. The first one, he actually may matter. Peter is probably going to be the one uh, who comes the closest to mattering. So in verse 2, the Bible says, here are the names of the 12 apostles. Um, Peter, um, first there was Simon, who was called, also called Peter. Now, we do get the hunch that he probably did matter. Simon, in the Greek, what it means is the one who hears God. If you have a name like that, there's a pretty good chance that you matter. Um, Peter, Petros, uh, what this translates to, like, seriously, if you live in the United States today, Petros, it means rock. You know, so Peter uh, would be the rock, just like the guy on TV, uh, the wrestler. You know, and finally, the rock has come back to Omaha. <laughs> so the 12 of you who watch the WWE know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> The rest of you will just have to trust us dozen that that was actually pretty funny. <laughs> so now there was uh, James. I'm sorry, uh, the next one is going to be Andrew, who's Peter's brother. Okay, I want to take a quick poll here. Does anyone have an older sibling um, who is very successful in life? Like a year older, two years older, three years older? Now, now you know what this guy feels. Like my sister Jane, like... Amber is, uh, you know, that's how we met. And my sister Jane is beautiful. She was the homecoming queen. She was smart. She was a good athlete. And all of a sudden, I get to high school. Oh, Jane's little brother's here. No, Jane's little brother's not here. Craig is here. <laughs> Jane's off to college. We don't need to talk about Jane. I'm Craig. I'm not, I matter, you know? But seriously, that, that's an issue that we deal with. The next one is going to be uh, James, the son of uh, Zebedee. Now, Zebedee, people knew who he was. He, he was a well-known man. So think about this, like this guy is the son of someone famous and like anyone kind of live in the shadow of a parent or something like that, oh, you're, uh, you're Jimmy's boy or you're, uh, you're Sally's girl. It's almost like we're saying, you know, I'm not sure if you matter, but your mom does matter. Your dad does matter. Then there's uh, John, who's James's brother. There's Phil, Bartholomew, Tom, Thomas. There's uh, Matthew, who's a tax collector. Now, when it says tax collector, don't think IRS agent here. Think uh, crook. Think like mafia. Think bully. I mean, these people were trying to extract. I mean, these were Romans who lived out in the provinces, and they're trying to extract as much money as they possibly can from people. Um, but what's really cool, what's really cool is like Jesus says, it doesn't matter who you've been. And if there's one of us today, if there's just one of us today, and, and you hear this, then this whole morning is worth it. If, if you've messed up so much, you still matter. Because what Jesus did is he picked a, a tax collector to be one of uh, his disciples. And then there is uh, James, the son of uh, Alphaeus. Um, anyone in here ever hear of Alphaeus? I haven't either. Um, you know, he, he's the son of a nobody. So it doesn't matter if, if your family is a bunch of nobodies. You're still a somebody because God has given you all authority and the grace that God has given you is now grace that you can give to other people. The, the power that God has given to you is the power that you can give to other people. So then there's also uh, Thaddeus. There's uh, Simon the Zealot. So Simon being a zealot, that would have been his profession. He would have been um, uh, a religious leader of a very um, zealous um, uh, faction of uh, Judaism, but, but what's really cool here is like, how about this one? Who in here has ever been asked what it is that you do for a living? Okay, do you like that? Do you like being defined by what you do? Like yesterday, I did a wedding at uh, Indian Creek Golf Course. Uh, so I walked there, I was about half hour early, which is about 15 minutes early normally for me. Um, but you know, I had my suit on and I was carrying a robe and all of a sudden, like the robe kind of gives it away that you're a pastor. I mean, it's, there's, there's not too many professions besides a judge who wears a robe, and I had this robe, and all of a sudden, like, you know, I was defined by what I do. Now, I'm going to give you a hint. Like, when you walk into a country club clubhouse um, with a robe, you're not going to be the life of the party. <laughs> there's not going to be people, hey, um, I've got this theological question for you real quick, Pastor, or uh, tell me a little bit about your church. I've been looking for a church. That's not the way that it works. Like, sometimes we are defined by what we do. And sometimes we perceive what we do doesn't matter. And Jesus says, that doesn't matter. I got this guy, he's a zealot. And he's going to be one of my disciples. And then there's uh, Judas Iscariot, obviously the one who uh, later betrayed him. So here's what Jesus was basically saying to the 12. And I want you to listen to this because I think that this is pretty much what Jesus is saying to each of us this morning. We live in a dark and a broken world. The world needs us. The world needs us to be light. The world needs us to be hope. The world needs us to be listeners. 
The world needs us uh, to speak words uh, of uh, encouragement. The world needs us to be people who pray. So what Jesus said to the disciples is something like this. I don't care who you are. I, I don't care what your name is. I don't care who your sister is. I don't care who your dad is. I don't care if you're rich. I don't care if you're poor. I don't, I don't care what you do. What I want you to do is I want you to come and I want you to follow me. And I want you to uh, go into the world and I want you to tell these people that my grace is available, that my, that my healing is available, that my, my hope is available. Now, here's one of the things we have to understand about the gospel. The gospel is not an, uh, a gospel of exclusion. Jesus here makes it very clear that the gospel is a gospel of inclusion. You know, sometimes maybe we feel that we're not good enough. Sometimes uh, we feel that we're just not quite like everybody else. And Jesus says, welcome. You matter. You are included. Now, in verse 5, Matthew continues, Jesus sent out the 12 disciples with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. And Listen to what it says here in verse 7. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Is near now. This word "near" it's it's a really interesting word. The word is parousia, and what this word means is you know this, the second coming of Christ that He's going to come again. Now, when we were when we read the word "near," we actually think that um, something's going to happen pretty soon. Now, this was written over two thousand years ago, and some of us might say, "Well, why hasn't this happened yet?" He said it's near. Now, I'm going to give you a hint. Near in the English language um, does not equal near in God's vocabulary. You know, God's been around for a long time. God's not going anywhere anytime soon. When God says the kingdom of heaven is near, he's the only one that knows what that means. All we can do is live a life of preparation. Now, this is an interesting time that we live in. Like, just read the newspapers or or watch the news. Like, Like, North Korea and Iran, like they're getting these nuclear weapons possibly, and there's like terrorism and maybe like climate change. I'm not a scientist. I don't know enough about that stuff. But you just read about that stuff and, you know, we know that maybe life as we know it here today isn't going to be the same as it is you know, 10 years from now or 20 years from now. And even when Jesus says the kingdom is, is near, like, we're all going to have to deal with this. Like every one of us in this room, whether you like it or not, you're going to die. And I know that this is not the most uplifting thing you're going to hear this morning. But, it, but it's true, and when Jesus says the kingdom is near, like it could be near for us corporately, or it could be near for us individually. Now, Jesus says, announce that the kingdom of heaven is near. Go to the hurting people and, and announce to them. Now, Jesus gives us, he gives us so many wonderful pictures of what the kingdom of heaven is like. Like every, almost every parable Jesus starts off, uh, he says, for the kingdom of heaven is like... And then he says, hey, there's this uh, story about a dad. And he's got two kids, and the younger kid um, wanted his money and his inheritance, so he actually took it. He went and he lived in a a distant land, and um, he squandered all this money, and he goes back to the dad. And, you know, we're kind of wondering, like, what's going to happen in this story? Because this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. So then what we find is the dad is actually waiting for the kid on the front porch of the house. The dad, he goes and, and he runs to the kid. The kid runs to him and they embrace. So all of a sudden, what we get to do as God's disciples is we get to go and share the wonderful, powerful, life-changing example of God's forgiveness. The same forgiveness that God has given to us is the same forgiveness that we get to share with others. You know, Jesus uh, tells this great parable about this uh, this landowner, and he goes out and hires all these people at 6 o'clock in the morning, and he goes and hires some more at 9 o'clock, and at noon, and at 3 o'clock, and 5 o'clock, and at the end of the day, he like reverses the order, he pays them all the same, and you read this thing, like, what are you talking about, Jesus? But then you realize, like, this is not a, a parable about fairness, this is a parable about grace. And every single one of us who has ever made a mistake... Every one of us who has ever snuck out of the vineyard, every one of us who has ever showed up late, we, at the end of the day, get a whole lot more than we deserve. And we can share the, the, this powerful message of grace to a broken and a hurting world. 
You know, Jesus tells us another story about a farmer. Um, this is where we get our name from. He was talking at the water's edge, and this farmer goes out and he scatters some seed on uh, a path, and he makes another investment in people, and he throws it among the thorns, and he makes another investment, and he throws it on the, the good soil. And all of a sudden, like, this soil uh, fertilizes this uh, seed, and the seed grows into a great big crop, and the farmer sees his investment. And the gospel that we get to proclaim is that God has invested in us. And just think about what your life could possibly look like if you were an investor in other people. Not everybody, but if you just invested in somebody, you know, your life would be different and someone else's life would be different as well. Now, um, I have a question for you. Do you believe this? Do you believe you matter? Now, you're the only person that can answer this question for you. I can't do it. The person sitting next to you can't do it. Now, I would say probably almost all of us up here in our minds, we believe that we matter. We actually believe that, that God has created us for a time such as this. We believe that God has put people in our lives that we can care about, people in our lives that we can listen to, people in our lives that we can encourage, uh, people in our lives that we can share God's powerful message of, of forgiveness and grace. I think we believe that. Now, some people will say that the longest distance uh, in the world is the 12 inches between your head and your heart. Because I wonder how many of us, when we actually look in the mirror, we can smile and we can say, you know what? Despite these crooked teeth and despite these wrinkles under my eyes and despite the hair that used to be here and it's now back here, um, <laughs> I matter. Yeah, I, I really matter. Um, yeah, I want to give you a couple stories. Uh, one of them is about my confirmation class. This uh, happened um, back in the 1980s. So all the girls in the picture have great big hair and most of us and the boys have big hair as well. And there was eight of us. Um, this is a little Methodist church in uh, northwest Iowa. And uh, it was a really cool Sunday. I don't really remember that much about it. I remember we uh, went there, and the pastor had a trouble with all our Scandinavian last names. And, you know, he is new to town and tried to tell some jokes. It wasn't that funny. You know the type of preacher I'm talking about. You don't <laughs> get that person here, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, other churches you've been to or watched on TV or something. So four years later, we, uh, we graduated, and it was still eight of us, um, you know, different clothes, different hairstyles, you know, some of us had hair in our faces, and we didn't when we were in eighth grade, and I was thinking, like, for you guys who are confirmed here today, um, there's a very good possibility um, that when you're seniors four years from now, um, you're going to be the first class that will graduate from our new building. That might be a really cool time. Don't know if it's going to happen by then. Uh, don't know if it'll happen before then. But y you guys can make history. And I just want to tell you this, that like these next four years, and I want to let you know, and all of us old people sitting behind you or beside you, um, most of them are probably going to agree with me. Your biggest challenges in life are not going to be relational challenges. Your biggest challenges in life are not going to be physical challenges. Your biggest challenges in life are not going to be emotional challenges. The biggest challenges that we have in life are going to be spiritual. You know, I'll tell you what, once your emotions get all messed up, all of a sudden, you know, spirituality becomes a central issue. You know, maybe some of you have not had to experience death with a loved one yet, but it's going to happen, and all of a sudden, life becomes a spiritual issue. You know, you're going to, you're going to see things, you're going to hear things, and I just want to encourage you that you have four years in front of you, and, I just, I just, and I'm going to promise you as a pastor, Chad is going to work with you uh, and your parents that we're going to do everything that we can do as a church you know, to make sure in four years that you are spiritually prepared you know, to go to college, to go to the military, to go into the workforce, to do whatever God is leading you to do. Now, I want to go back to my confirmation class. Um, it was that day in 1988 was the last time all eight of us were together. The next time was about 15 or 16 years later. Uh, we gathered in the same church. This time, however, I was uh, wearing a black robe. It was the same robe that I uh, wore yesterday at the wedding. 
Um, two of my classmates sang some of the most passionate, heartfelt music that you could ever imagine. You know, two or three of the other classmates uh, sat in the first row, right next to uh, the family. And one of my childhood best friends, his name was Craig as well, he lay motionless in a casket right before me. You know, he had a wife, um, three or four year old daughter, a baby that was on the way. He died uh, in a heart attack right before he was supposed to go out on a date with his wife. And I'll tell you what, um, the biggest challenges that you're going to face in life are not emotional, they're not relational, they're not physical, they're spiritual. And Amber will tell you this, I, I worked harder on that one than I probably ever had to work before. You know, because it was really probably the first person close to me that had ever died that I had done a funeral for. And I thought about that, and I, I said, I got to convey two things to people. First of all, that, that Craig mattered. I have to let people know that because he did matter. His life wasn't nearly long enough, but he did matter. He mattered to people, and he mattered to God. And there's another thing that I had to communicate as well, and that is that uh, everybody else had to know that they mattered as well. Just like the guy whose life was way too short, um, they matter. You know, when I was a pastor in Iowa, my first church out of seminary, um, we had a kid in the church. His uh, name was Jimmy. Now, Jimmy was kind of a troublemaker. Jimmy was very disruptive at our youth group meetings. Uh, he got disruptive in church sometimes. He was not a very pleasant kid to be around, um, 16, 17 years old. Jimmy um, knocked on the window of the church one night, probably about six months, maybe a year after we lived there. Um, it was light inside, dark outside. I couldn't see who it was. I opened up the window. Um, you know, I says, can you let me in? I let him in. Basically, this kid like, tells me his life story. And he didn't say it in so many words, but he just says, yeah, I, I don't matter. You know, my parents adopted me, and then they had a couple biological kids that they didn't think they would ever be able to have, and I don't feel like I matter to them. Yeah, I've never mattered to the teachers. I don't matter to my friends. And he says, it was cold out. Um, you remember the night, it was cold. And uh, he says, I don't have any place to go. Can I, can I stay with you? Now, we had never, like, took in a 16 or a 17-year-old kid before. We just had uh, Benjamin. He was probably three or four months at the time. So I call Amber up on the phone, and I'm, like, praying she doesn't answer. <laughs> but uh, she answered the phone, and I said, hey, I got uh, Jimmy here at the church. Um, he wants to know if uh, he can come and stay with us. Now, they did not write that in the pastor's wife description um, when we got married. And, of course, she said yes. And remember, we brought him home, and he fed him all that food, and he, he ate it. And uh, you know, over the next couple months, he stayed with us, and I only tried to teach him one thing, that he matters. That was the thing that I wanted to teach him, is that, uh, that he matters. So, kids, and for all of us uh, who are sitting beside you, for all of us who are sitting behind you, I want you to know that you matter. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who your parents are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter uh, what you look like. It doesn't matter if you're uh, 13. It doesn't matter if you're 93. You matter. We live in a dark and a broken and a needy world. And God invites you and God invites all of us to uh, accept his authority and share with the world the same grace that God has given to us. To share the world with the, the same forgiveness that, that God has given us. And to invest, to invest, to radically invest our lives into others' lives just as God has invested in each of us.